Yeah, so morning everyone. <clears throat> I have runny nose as well, so you're not alone here. Um, I guess over the next three days, you'll be exposed a lot with very useful technical, practical stuff. Uh, and since some of you are looking forward for a coffee break, so I'm going to share more of the fluffy, wishy-washy stuff now. And I'm going to show you within 15 minutes why it's also useful for you. Um, so it's quite overwhelming, right? And this is always what we feel when we deal with data. Um, one question is what data can give us. Um, but the other thing is like, how do you make, se or make sense of those data, right? So uh, today I'm going to focus on two things. One, talking about the usefulness of data visualization and also looking at the social life of data and how it can better inform you uh, to better make sense of those data. So as uh, you guys have briefly mentioned uh, earlier, Pulse Lab Jakarta is the sister agency, i.e. the black sheep of UNDP. Uh, we were established in late 2012 as a collaboration between the government of Indonesia and the United Nations, and our initial mandate is to use to harness new sources of digital data for development and humanitarian actions. But um, over the years, we have grown into what we call a data plus agency, where we don't only look at big data, but we also try to look at stories behind those data. Um, I'm just going to be very practical. I'm going to share stories with you guys now. Um, one of the project that we did last year was uh, it's called Haze Gazer. Has everyone has someone seen this before? So it's it's it's, it's basically um, a crisis management and a visual a visualization tool that uh, sort of like map the location of um, forest fire in Indonesia. So just a bit of background, 2015 was actually one of the worst year in Indonesia when it comes to forest fire. Um, and we created this tool to have a better understanding on where the forest fire exists, so where are the hotspots, um, the magnitude of the uh, fire, but also the social signals, what people actually uh, complain about what people actually say uh, in those affected areas and we mine those data from uh, social media. So just a very quick one. These are some of the data that we get um, from uh, Hayes Gazer. Can someone help me make sense of this? Like, what can you tell from this data? What are you measuring? It's the number of uh, hotspots. Define hotspots. Uh, points. Points. Yeah. Points where uh, fire exists. Anyways, forget, forget this. <laughs> now, if you look at this, this actually gives. Uh, this is the, almost the exact same data as the one I showed you before, but when presented differently you begin to see a different context. It's not just numbers. This shows in 2015, Indonesia was literally on fire. The red dots represents the number of hotspots. And yeah, as you can see, it was literally on fire. And see, when you visualize information differently, you begin to see different context to it as well. Um, it enables you to better prioritize your actions, it enables you to see like, oh, which uh, part you should focus the most. And um, this is basically the whole Haze Gazer dashboard. Um, it just looks cooler as well. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I can share with you guys on some of the insights that we get from this uh, platform. So. If we look at the government interventions and development agency, uh, agency intervention in uh, regards to this uh, forest fire issue, most of the focus has been on fire prevention and risk reduction. We're talking about criminalizing illegal loggings, we're talking about peatland recovery, we're talking about alternative sources of farming, basically to make people not want to burn forests. And um, while it's really, really irrelevant, and most of this work has been done uh, with the Ministry of uh, Forestry and um, Environment. So while it's really irrelevant, 
but if we see what people talk about on social media, it actually tells a different story. Um, people talk about them being busy, coughing, eye irritation, like this green area here. It shows the magnitude of what people talk about in social media during the Hays crisis. And um, most of their concerns, it's on health-related concerns, actually. So yeah, people are talking about, oh, let's create a campaign, let's create a movement, no fire, what can we do to stop this? But most of the people, they just share their day-to-day -day experience when, they, uh, when they're exposed to it uh, with haze. And quite frankly, there hasn't been enough um, interventions already that focuses on this, that focuses on the health-related uh, concern. So this is also one way uh, that I want to show you how by visualizing information differently, you start to see, oh, you know, like how to better uh, focus uh, your interventions. Um, what's also quite interesting here is that there's education-related concern. It seems to be not that directly correlated, right? Can some of you just give like an assumption as to why people actually have some educator-related concerns? It's kids playing sport at school. Yeah, so kids can go, go to school. That's actually that's true. So that's you cannot really see this, but uh, on the top uh, graph there, um, if we look at people's education-related concerns from Twitter, uh, it's about school closure. So during the haze period, they um, intermittently <coughs> closed schools and. It's for a good purpose, really. Like they want kids to stay at home, uh, they want kids to be safer, but there are some unintended consequences, of course. And um, this is what we get from Hayes Gazer. So we understand, okay, what's happening now? But if we really want to understand why is it happening, uh, what's the context of this school uh, closure? Maybe a ten-year-old can better explain it than me. Pagi itu saya berangkat ke sekolah seperti biasanya. Saya sudah memakai seragam merah putih. Sampai di sekolah teman-temanku bilang, sekolah libur karena kabut asap. Saya cepat-cepat pulang. Bangun tidur saya lari ke lapangan bola untuk bermain bola. Ada banyak kabut asap di sekeliling kami waktu kami bermain bola. Tetapi saya masih bisa melihat teman-teman saya. Saya juga bisa melihat kemana bola ditendang. Saya terus bermain bola sampai sore. Besoknya saya berangkat sekolah. Saya masuk ke kelas. Saya belajar seperti biasanya. Hei, lonceng istirahat. Pertama berbunyi. Saya se segera berlari keluar untuk memberi teh dan bubur. Tapi lonceng sekolah berbunyi empat kali. Teng, 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 teng. Itu tandanya akan ada pengumuman. Kami harus berbaris sesuai ke kelas kami. Kepala sekolah bilang sekolah diliburkan lagi karena kabut asap. Saya senang. Kami semua pulang. Saya senang sekali sekolah diliburkan. So yeah, um, some of our partners talk to uh, this guy, this tech. Um, any, any new discoveries? Any new understanding? Instead of going to school, they play football. Yeah. Which was worse. 
<laughs> so what does it mean? When you talk to them, when you look at them beyond numbers, you begin to see that they actually have stories, right? Um, for Pascalis, this kid, like, there's no point of closing school. School for me is a space to play. I don't care about learning. If you close my school, then I wouldn't be able to meet my friends. So he still ended up playing soccer outside, which actually is worse than uh, being at school, right? He missed uh, his learnings at school. Uh, it actually worsens the health impact. And if you really think of it in more details, how about the parents? Like the parents actually put him in school so that they can go to work. It's a free daycare basically, right? But now what happens, right? And the school, they're like, oh no, it's better to close the school because we don't want to take responsibility if kids are dying in our school, you know? You get these stories. And um, we actually uncovered these stories because um, our best designer, Lodi, well, went with UNICEF talking about interagency collaboration. Uh, it's a project that we did with the uh, UNICEF where we, uh, using the insights that we get from Ace Gazer, we look at uh, specifically the education and uh, health impact, uh, especially to kids in the affected areas. And um, yeah, this, this understanding from Ace Gazer really helps us to prioritize our focus, uh, knowing where to go, what to ask, uh, what are the, their concerns, uh, but, like I mentioned earlier, we get the what's, right? But we get the why's, we get the, uh, how people do the things they do, uh, their life context and everything, uh, by going there, talking to them, sleeping with them, not in that kind of way, but almost literally. Um, and just basically by having conversation with them. And this is why we think that ethnographic approach reaches deep into people's heart. And um, especially, especially working with government in our experiences, they're so bogged down with prove it, prove it, prove it. Is this uh, representative enough? Uh, what's the sample? And that's good, that's really important. But sometimes it makes us forget that there's lives behind, the, behind those data and those lives actually are the key ingredients to us designing intervention programs and services that are centered around uh, their life context, right? And so maybe some of the findings or some of the stories that we found through our ethnographic approach is rather anecdotal, and it might not, it might not be representative of the whole population, but what we believe is what's measurable is not the same with what's valuable. If we're talking about innovation, it needs to live in the company of imagination, right? And um, stories gives us inspiration. So we have a good balance between evidencing and um, inspiration. And what we hope from this approach of combining big data analysis and uh, borrowing from a fellow uh, friend of ours, uh, Tricia Wang, thick data, this fluffy stuff, we uh, get to produce reliable insights at scale, but at the same time also uncover stories that uh, reaches deep into people's heart. What we hope is for us to be able to turn all of this logic into magic. Thank you.